cursor when this doesn't work. Calling this meeting of the City Monterey Planning Commission to order. Thank you. Um, this is for Tuesday, April 25th, 2023, uh, afternoon session, 4 p.m. And can we have a roll call, please? Chair Fletcher? Here. Vice Chair Bluth? Here. Commissioner Brathfield? Present. Commissioner Dawson? Here. Commissioner Freeman? Here. And L Commissioner Latassa is currently absent, but if he does show up, I will try to mark that time of arrival. Okay. And for staff present, we have Community Development Director Cole, um, Interim Public Works Director Rennie, and Associate Planner Sabdo, and myself, Recording Secretary Cleary. And I will also use this opportunity to announce that members of the public are encouraged to join our meetings via ZoomGov, a secure service that connects you live with no live time. The meeting is also streamed live on youtube.com slash city of Monterey with a 10 second delay and Comcast channel 25 with up to a 90 second delay. If you would like to provide public comment, please join the meeting using Zoom or by telephone, making sure to join in time to accommodate delays. To join the Zoom meeting from a computer or phone, use the link or phone numbers on the agenda posted at isearchmonterey.org. Since the meeting has started, you'll find the agenda under the recent tab. To join by telephone, dial 833-568 8864 toll free, then enter the webinar ID 161-990-8039. Once again, the phone number to call is 833-568-8864. And the webinar ID is 161-990-8039. If prompted for a participant ID, press pound. Detailed instructions for using Zoom are available at monterey.org slash public meetings. To provide public comment via Zoom, please use the raise your hand function at the bottom of your screen. To provide comments by phone, dial star nine to raise your hand, then star six to unmute when called upon. Public commenters will be announced using their last three phone number digits or the name typed into Zoom. Public commenters will be muted until it is their turn to speak. Please turn off TV or computer speakers or go to another room while connected as background noise interferes with the broadcast. Public speakers will be called upon in order of hands raised. There is a three minute time limit for today's meeting. Please stay within that limit. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're gonna open our consent agenda. There's one item on the consent agenda. It's the minutes for our April 11th meeting. Um, any member of the public or the commission uh, can pull this item off the consent agenda for discussion. And so anybody? Doesn't look like it. So. We'll move on to have um, a review of this. Anybody would like to make a motion? Any comments? Move to accept as presented. Okay. Second. I'll second that. We have a motion and a second. Further discussion? Roll call vote, please. Chair Fletcher? Yes. Vice Chair Bluth? Yes. Commissioner Brassfield? Yes. Commissioner Dawson? Yes. Commissioner Freeman? Yes. And Commissioner Latassa is still absent for this item. Okay, we're going to um, open up public comments for items not on the agenda. Um, anyone can speak or to, yes, we have someone. And could you state your name, please? Uh, good afternoon, commissioners. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Yes, thank uh, you. Um, I, I wish to encourage you to incorporate more mass transit variables into your planning projects, such as trains and carpools and uh, luxury buses. Um, for example, any new project that comes before you must incorporate a mass transit alternative and any new building project or projects, be they large or small, must save trees. I have come across three projects, one the Fisherman's Wharf parking lot and two Ryan Ranch parking lot, and both projects took trees away, about 10 at the wharf and 318 planned for Ryan Ranch and another 75 trees for Iris Canyon. And that's a lot of trees. It takes about 19 full grown 50 year old trees to clean, clean the air for one gallon of gas. Trees are our saviors and we cannot fool ourselves into thinking we can mitigate a 50 year old tree by planting a three or six foot sapling. Many times they don't make it and with climate change, their chances are even less. Also they burn as a fuel because they are small. 
It seems every project of the three I mentioned above all have no environmental consequence or CEQA effect. CEQA is only there for our protection and good. It is not the enemy. Mother Nature is not going to negotiate with us. It is only going to become more fierce, and we better start treating it right with respect for its awesome power to totally destroy us. Look at Houston, totally flooded, unheard of. In all my 76 years, I've never witnessed the turquinas, the hurricanes, the constant escalating heat waves and windstorms. This is nature's way of trying to regulate itself like a floundering whale harpooned by our lifestyles. You are the key. You're the most powerful body on this peninsula. And you can change that. You can start saying, no, if you want this project that's going to bring in 7,000 more daily trips, you've got to have a train here. Up in the, in the Bay Area, they are people are over are crowding the trains it's a beautiful sight and it's wonderful to take them but here we're all congested and so i'm asking you please for the sake of us all you each one of you are the most powerful people on this peninsula i never realized that until i started looking at planning thank you could you state your name please for the record i guess not all right, anyone else, anyone online? There are no hands raised online. No one else in the chambers, then we'll move on to our um, our regular agenda, our public hearing. We have two items today. Item number three is uh, consider 425 Alvarado Street. It's a one-year review and extension of a permit amendment application PA 200276 to extend the Whiskey Club bar use. The applicant is uh, Mitchell Swahimi. Owner is Carmel TDK LLC. PCD Planned Community and Downtown Zoning District, Commercial General Plan Land Use Designation, and this is exempt from CEQA for Article 19, Section 15301, Class 1. And with that, can we have a staff report? Sorry, I know you're not a button. Um, um, oh, actually, no, it's showing with the extras filed. Thank you for asking that. Better. Thank you. I appreciate your patience. Okay, I think that will go away in a second. Um, thank you, Commission. Um, this afternoon, you're considering the one year review of a use permit, and that's for a, a, a whiskey club bar use that was established on Alvarado Street about a year ago at 425 Alvarado Street. And our recommendation to you is that you receive this review and you adopt a resolution extending the use permit for this use indefinitely subject to conditions of approval. They basically had a one year trial period. So the Whiskey Club is a full bar use. It was approved by the Planning Commission in January of 2021 um, via a permit amendment. Um, the club serves distilled spirits, wine and beer and is also a retail bottle shop. So they do all of those things within the premise. There are 11 bar seats and 20 seats at tab the tables. The hours of operation are Monday through Saturday, 11 a.m. to midnight, and Sunday, um, 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. There are a security system and measures that were built into the original project approval. So the planning commission, and this is something you've done more recently, 
for bar establishments is to require review one year after it's been operating so we can review what's been occurring at the site and whether any additional conditions of approval need to be imposed. Um, this review was delayed, as, as we mentioned, by um, from January to April um, because um, the club didn't open to the public until April of 2022. So construction of their business took a while. And so we um, basically made sure this happened one year from the date of their opening. Um, so from staff's perspective, the club has complied with all use permit conditions of approval, including the hours of operation. The planning division has received no complaints, nor have our, our code compliance division. Um, the police department has received a few complaints unrelated to the business operations. Um, they've received four complaints about unhoused persons loitering or walking in the area in front of the business. This is not uncommon in our downtown. Um, they, there was one parking dispute in a, a parking space directly in front of the business, and there were three vandalism reports um, to the windows, but no damage was reported. Um, so from staff's perspective, both the planning division, as well as the police department and code compliance, there have really been no issues related to the business operations during the last year. And so we see this as a very straightforward recommendation um, that the planning commission receive this one year review and adopt a resolution extending the whiskey club use permit indefinitely subject to conditions of approval. And I know the business owners here as well, if you have questions for him, I'm sure he's happy to answer them. Thank, Thank you. you First, presentation. Any questions for Kim? I, I had just had one, yes. There seemed to be an answer to a question without the question in front of it. And that was an ADA issue of a barrier inside the building. Oh, the glass wall. Yeah, yeah. so one of the, um, the original project plan showed a barrier to be installed. And um, when the project, so the projects first obtain their use permit here, and then they obtain their building permit for the actual construction. And what was discovered is that wall that we thought was going to be installed um, was in conflict with the building code. So it was eliminated from the project plans. Thank you. Okay, um, any other questions for Kim? Before? Yeah, I have one question. Um, many of you know I'm down there from 6.30 to 8, several mornings a week cleaning up and the uh, premises is clean as a whistle, absolutely clean as a whistle. And I wonder, I'm reading item number four, installation and monitoring of security cameras and alarm system, using an ID scanner that retains customer ID information for 48 hours, et cetera. Are other bars on Alvarado Street subject to the same scrutiny as this one is? So it depends when the bar opened. Um, I would Tanya say arms is the one I'm thinking. Yeah. Of. So it depends. Um, we added those conditions of approval based on some lessons learned in our downtown. Uh -huh. um, I don't know if this commission remembers, but there was a period where we were actually working with our police department and ABC and bringing bars in front of this commission for punitive um, actions um, and what we would do is place conditions of approval to make the facility close earlier. Um, ABC would um, restrict alcohol license operations and it's a very different, you know, that was probably, well, it's definitely pre-2012 um, that we were really struggling in our downtown um, with out, um, businesses that sold alcohol and we're not we're not hearing any of that anymore from our mm -hmm. police department and it was sort of after um some of those um cases that we started to implement more stringent requirements through the use permit including this one year review it's worked really well mm -hmm. at least from my perspective thank you any other questions for kim All right next we'll go to the applicant Thank you. Thank you for being here and approving our original permit and considering, uh, you know, removing these conditions uh, or extending the permit indefinitely. We are a more of a whiskey tasting room. We are considered one of the best whiskey tasting rooms in the country. 
Uh, we have 600 different uh, expressions of whiskey uh, for uh, tasting, as well as we are a full cocktail lounge uh, as per the ABC's requirement. Uh, we have received excellent press coverage. Also, you know, our reviews online speak for themselves. We have almost all five-star reviews on Google. The one review that is not is because of pricing. You don't get rare whiskey for $10 an ounce. I can't help that, <laughs> you know. But other than that, it's been a privilege to be part of this community. And uh, we are slowly yet steadily becoming a destination location for whiskey enthusiasts all throughout the country. Uh, every week we hear oh, two, four, or six people say, hey, you know, we flew out just to come here. And then, hey, it was in Monterey, so why not? And it's been great to see the appreciation in the community as well as from visitors and folks that come to the conference center. So thank you again, and I'm here if you have any questions. Thank you. Questions? Uh, yes, well, I'll wait till comment. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, is there anyone in the audience that would like to speak on this? Jennifer, anybody online raising hands? I see no hands currently raised online, but just a reminder, um, the phone number to call is 833-568. 8864. The webinar ID is 161-990-8039. If you're already joined via Zoom, please use the raise your hand function to raise your hand. Or if you're by phone, dial star nine to raise your hand, then star six to unmute when called upon. And no hands are going up. So I think there are no commenters. Okay, so we'll close the public. Uh hearing portion of this and bring it back to commissioners for comments. You had one. When this project came before the commission, I was a little surprised and I had high expectations, but a question of whether Monterey would support it. But I can tell you, I've had at least in the last year and a half, three people come up and unsolicited were complimentary about this business. I was a little surprised, but I don't compare it to a winery because it's a little bit more expensive than most wineries. But I'd, I was surprised and very pleased to see that it is now gaining an advantage to the vitality of our Alvarado. I really appreciate that. I, I would agree with that. It's been a great addition to the street. And coupled with Helm's Next Star, it creates a nice unit and uh, well-traveled and well-kept. Anyone else? Yeah, no, I, I think it's a great um, replacement for Lucky Duck. They've handled their situation um, fantastically. And like you said, I mean, it's a wonderful additional Alvarado. And I think it goes well with the um, cigar store, which has been there forever too, just down the street. So hopefully that's going to bring in a whole bunch more people to Alvarado walking up the street to get there and have to pass everything else on the way. Nice. Any other comments? I just one. Um, this looks like a like an easy decision to make, yeah. and so I'm going to uh, um, move that we uh, that we accept it as as presented. Okay. Thank you. Second. Second. A motion and a second. Further discussion? Okay, Jennifer, can we have a vote call? Chair Fletcher? Yes. Vice Chair Bluth? Yes. Commissioner Brassfield? Yes. Commissioner Dawson? Yes. Commissioner Freeman? Yes. And Commissioner Latassa is still absent. Still absent. This motion carries with the vote of five. And it is appealable to the city council with forms found at the planning office within the next 10 days. Just to clarify for my own records, um, was that Commissioner Dawson you seconded and then um and then Commissioner Freeman? Commissioner. I mean, sorry, Commissioner Dawson, you motioned and then Freeman seconded. Okay, yes. thank you. I didn't catch that. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Moving on, on to item number four. 
This is a recommend to the city council that the capital improvement program CIP projects for 2023 2024 fiscal year are consistent with the general plan area plans master plans specific plans coastal plans traffic calming plans. And uh, move to move Monterey uh, multimodal plan. This is exempt from CEQA per Article 19, Section 15301, 15302, 15306. This is not a project under CEQA, Article 20, Section 15378, and under General Rule Article 5, Section 15061, or Initial Study Mitigated Negative, previously prepared and um, certified. And can we have a staff report there, please? Hi, my name is Christy Sabdo, Associate Planner with the City of Monterey. I'll be presenting. Um, there are a list of CIP projects that Public Works has put together. There are 44 projects. Um, they are included in Exhibit A of your staff report. And later I can pull up the list if we want to uh, if you have any questions about those, and we have public works staff here, Andrea Rennie and Tom Hardy. Um, the projects range from citywide projects, uh, Measure S, to um, improvement and repair of city facilities, uh, recreation facilities, Monterey fire stations, um, to other smaller projects. Um, staff has prepared a consistency analysis with um, making sure that each of the projects is consistent with our general plan, area and specific plans, uh, master plans, the move Monterey multimodal plan, coastal plans and traffic calming plans. And all of the projects have been found to be consistent. Uh, so when reviewing the projects for compliance with the California Environmental Quality Act, uh, projects were either not a project under CEQA, they were exempt or they require further review. So those projects that um, are exempt fell under these three categories, um, including existing facilities that require repair and maintenance or minor alterations, um, replacement or reconstruction um, of existing facilities, and information collection. So again, there are 44 CIP projects uh, for the 2023-24 fiscal year. Um, three of the, these projects are not a project under CEQA. Um, 17 of the projects are exempt. 23 projects require further review because um, perhaps they're in the um, archaeological area that's sensitive in the city and we need to, uh, we might need an archaeological study or the project is not well defined and we need more information before we can determine um, if it is exempt or not. Um, one of the projects is um, already has a final an um, initial study mitigated negative declaration that was approved. So that project will fall under that document. Um, so this just specifically lists which projects are which. So those projects that are not a project under CEQA are um, these three here. I don't know if you want me to describe them, but um, the CIP contingency, uh, it just provides a contingency to those CIP projects that are funded in the past years and addresses cost increases. Um, the ALPR for enforcement scooters, um, it'll be three new automatic license plate lot units for enforcement scooters. And the utility flow level monitoring is purchasing of monitoring devices. Um, 16 CEQA project or 16 of the CIP projects were exempt and I have two slides here um, listing which projects are exempt some of them are um, like there's no impact to um, native soil so there are no archaeological impacts uh, there are in interior remodeling um, or or upgrades that wouldn't have environmental impacts painting, et cetera. And then um, 22 of the projects uh, will require further review by planning staff to determine if they are exempt or if they require an initial study. 
forever. And um, the one project that has an initial study that's already been approved is the programmatic wharf repa repairs um, approved by the city council in 2020. Um, staff recommends that the planning commission adopt a resolution recommending to the city council that the CIP projects for the 2023-2024 fiscal year are consistent with the general plan, area plan, specific plans, master plans, coastal plans, traffic calming plans, and the move Monterey multimodal plan. Um, I'm available to answer any CEQA related questions and Public Works is available to answer any CIP project related questions. Thank you, Christy. Any questions? Later for Andrea and Tom. Do you have any questions? Not for Christy. I want to have one, two, three of the projects I wanted to ask for a little more information on. We can do that right now. Good afternoon. Oh. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Andrea Rennie, Public Works Director, and I have Tom Hardy, Deputy, Acting Deputy Public Works Director, City Engineer, and we're available to answer any questions on the projects. Okay. I have uh, three that uh, jumped out at me. The uh, programmatic wharf repairs at 300000 a year every three years. Does that mean that you're going to do a little bit each year? or it's all at once? That's a great question. What we do is we do 300,000 a year, and then we do one large project where we do a lot of the wharf repairs to the piers. Okay. Um, the next one was the waterfront parking lot resurface restripe uh, ADA phase two. Is this the same uh, parking lot reconstruction, reconfiguration that came before the ARC, I want to say four years ago, where uh, the entrance to the main wharf parking lot, um, the orientation was changed, the number of parking spaces was changed, that lot? So it's a lot adjacent to the waterfront lot. It's the marina lot that's under construction right now. The one near the old boatyard. Uh, does not include the old the boat yard. That's across, that's across the road. It's adjacent. Adjacent, but not the same one. Mm -hmm. I think the general boundaries can be described as wharf two, right? Um, to the harbor master office on the inside where mm -hmm. the boat ramp is, and then Dust Bowl Brewery on the other side in the ocean. So, um, it's been under construction now for how many months? Yeah, so this is for contingency and lighting and any other um, improvements that we, we need to do to finish the project, so. Yeah, and then the last question, you know, I spent so long on the ARC where they didn't want electronic or digital signs in front of hotels and digital signs that, you know, tell you who's coming and what events are being sponsored. So this one where it said parking facility, electronic signage, is this one of those signs that says there's 65 spaces left on floor two and 25 on floor one? Yes, that's correct. And does that go along with the signage rules and regulations? Uh, those are signs that would be in the right of way and they would have the same wayfinding sign color scheme. So we would have a match the wayfinding signage. Outside on the street? So yes. you could see them outside mm -hmm. on the street? So Kim, does that does that comply with our signage rules? I believe so. Where are the signs proposed, Andrea? So right now, I think in our wayfinding um, uh, program, we have a couple that are in front of the garages, east and west garage, east and west garages. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the downtown specific plan, and we can pull it up. Assumed it, it talked about in the specific plan as people approach the garages, it would be good for them to know what the current availability of parking is in that facility. So if you're driving into the garage, it says 200 spaces available or 400 spaces available. So it was clear that there was parking available. Um, or, or if it says that the, uh, the, that the cannery road parking lot is full, 
you better turn off now. Yeah. So I believe we could pull up the downtown specific plan and show you that section if you would like. It just rang a bell. Yeah. Yeah. And so the Sorry. for the difference between the digital signs and the hotels have been internally illuminated signs. And the ARC has had a lot of discussion over the years whether or not the light goes through the front face of the sign or out the sides of the sign and the, the front is opaque. So I think that this is proposed is consistent with our plan, but it's a different section. Okay. And we would clarify the cost also, the right. Any any other questions? I'll have a sir. Cry one question. I listened to NCIP the other night, and there was a number of projects identified as that may be inclusive in other programs. Are they included here or not? Or is it going to be next year? So um, this list is an all-inclusive list with every proposed project. It does not by any means mean that this is the final list of projects that are funded. We have way more needs than we have funding. So what we were trying to do is um, make sure that they were consistent with all the plans so that if they were funding. So there are a couple of things that we're still working on the estimates. Um, the general fund number that we are working with is $2 million and we have more needs than we do have the funding. Mm -hmm. So some of these projects will probably not be funded. And some of these projects, um, and Tom, correct me if I'm wrong, some of these projects, ex especially some of the um, youth center projects were also proposed as NCIP projects, correct? Yes. That, um, yes, the um, parks department submitted a number of projects. The NCIP committee actually is, is really it's almost like a grant program because you submit your project, but then it takes months before you can figure out whether it's going to be funded or not. Um, so they're kind of, I guess I've have applied to CIP and NCIP, and if it's funded under one or the other, then they'll know to pull it from one or the other. Is what I'm assuming. But yes, they they would appear some of the projects. And the ones I'm thinking of are all parks related, but they're they're on both lists. They won't be double funded this year. That include Measure S projects. Yes, yeah. If it's if it's funded under Measure S, then we'd pull them from both. Actually, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? All right, uh, Jennifer. Anybody online wanting to speak? I do have, see a hand raised online. So, Lisa, I will allow you to unmute. Good afternoon, uh, commissioners and all city staff. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, I've got a couple questions. Uh, if someone could identify what ALPR, what that acronym stands for. And then my other question are the 23 projects that are not funded is, did I miss a slide for that? And one final question, the sewer root foaming, that is one of the 16 CEQA exempt projects. Could someone just explain that a bit more? Thank you so much. And I, I realize you may not uh, answer public questions, but at least I thought I'd put it out there and maybe see if I could get an answer. Thank you. You want to give it a shot? I can respond. Yes. yes. Thank you. To, to two of them anyway. Um, the first one was about the ALPR, which stands for Automatic License Plate Reader, um, which Christy actually mentioned that going through. But those are the on the scooters now, the parking um, scooters. They have the automatic license plate readers. So instead of smacking you with chalk, they'll just read your license plate and it'll be computerized and they can keep a record of how long you were there. So that's what ALPR stands for. The sewer root foaming project. Um, in the sewer lines, there are roots that get in through the, the joints typically, and they'll get into the, um, 
into the line and block the capacity of some of the lines. So in areas where we know that occurs, we uh, have a program to go in with the, some kind of material that removes the roots and it's a foaming product um, that goes through. And that's what that program was. And then the third, or actually was the second question about the 23 unfunded projects. I think that was uh, 23 projects that were, um, that was it needed for the review or, and it had nothing to do about the, the 23 projects that, that Christy had in her presentation didn't have anything to do with the funding. Um, we're still working out the details of which projects this year will be funded, but there were uh, 22 further CEQA review required projects, which I, I think is what you're describing. And those would just be because there's not enough detail um, right now on the project, we would have to come back and get a CEQA determination on the specific project once we know more about what the actual extent and scope of the project would be. So right now it might just be money to fund, uh, you know, like a parking lot maintenance thing, but later on we might realize, oh, it's under a giant cypress tree or something. So there would be potentially could be concerns with that. So we would come back with that. We don't know the details of uh, a lot of those at this time. Okay, thank you for clarifying. Mm -hmm. um, anybody else online? There are no further hands on ra online raised. Back to council chambers, do you wish to speak? Could you step up please? My concern is um, the parks department and this um, hysteria over non-natives and the uh, widespread use of uh, herbicides. Um, that's going to happen at Iris Canyon with the red-legged frog that's a threatened species. And um, it shouldn't be happening. I mean, 55% of all plants in the United States are non-native. So this was originally uh, developed by Monsanto in the 50s, um, this uh, non-native hysteria that has now, you know, literally destroyed thousands and thousands uh, of, uh, you know, eucalyptus in Angel Island, for instance, um, they cut down all the eucalyptus except six acres. And about five years later, they had a brush fire. And the only place that didn't burn was where the eucalyptus were because they, the fog dripped into the brush fire below, the brushes below. Long story short, we have got not to use these herbicides and the parks department's been very good about it, but they do want to use them. And so it's coming back big time. And I think it's up to you to really make sure that in this community, we don't use that anymore. We use mechanical means, and especially not on the threatened species like the red-legged frog. So um, um, I'm very concerned about that. I did read that there's going to be restoration of, you know, in these um, rivers and um, non-natives will be taken out. And uh, so that means, I know in Iris Canyon, that's, that's the plan. And um, I, I just, I think we've got to be very, very careful about uh, removing trees. Every tree counts. And you can't medicate, and everything is non sequa and a negative declaration, and we're just going in the wrong direction. And I think you here can really stop that from happening. And I, I hope that you do. I, I really do. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, we'll close the public comment on this, bring it back to commissioners for a recommendation to the city council. Anybody have anything to discuss first of all, and if not, how about a motion? I make a motion that we approve the recommendation to city council that the cap capital improvement program project for 23-24 fiscal year are consistent with the general plan, area plan, et cetera and et cetera. Okay, a motion. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. 
Any other discussion? Okay, Jennifer, can we do a roll call vote? Chair Fletcher? Yes. Vice Chair Bluth? Yes. Commissioner Brathfield? Yes. Commissioner Dawson? Yes. Commissioner Freeman? Yes. Commissioner Latassa is still absent. This yeah. motion carries with a vote of five, and it is not appealable to the planning or to the city council because it is already going to be heard by the city council. Okay, thank you. Next on the agenda, commissioners' comments. Any wisdom from our commissioners? Yes, I do have a comment, um, and, and it's good that Andrea is here because I, I, I I'm aiming it right at her. Um, I noticed that uh, a lot of the, the 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 signal lights in town take for darn ever to change. Is have have you done something tricky to those guys, or <laughs> or what, what what is it? What, what can we do to to get back our our short timing? I don't mind. Um, so we have installed an adaptive signal system. And so what it does is it may um, individually impact folks, but what it's trying to do is look at the big picture and platoon the cars so that we have less stop and go. So we did change some things on Pacific. And if you notice, um, all of the pedestrian uh, signals for the side streets are now on so that folks don't have to sit there and wait. Um, so we're still tweaking them a little bit, but what we're trying to get is we're trying to get a progression. So for example, um, a common one that we hear about is Soledad and Yep. So it has a longer cycle because what it does is allows the other intersections to double cycle. And one of the things that we've done is uh, store some cars on Pacific Street as they're trying to make a left onto Soledad so that we're not blocking the intersection. And then what we do is we have the green on Munras to then clear out that queue. So there's been a lot of, of tweaking that we've done. So, so it may look like it's not working um, well for, for individuals, but it is trying to work well as a system um, so that we can reduce greenhouse gases through stop it, and get. It's almost to the point where you wanna just rush the light because it's just please stuck. don't do that <laughs> <laughs> yeah we can we can tweak it if there's uh specific uh intersections that you're having an issue with a lot of times also what happens is we have especially in the high winds and the storms we've had i have a great photo of a seagull uh, sitting on one of our traffic cameras and what they do is they sit on them and then sometimes the traffic camera goes down <laughs> so it's thinking there's there's nobody there when there is somebody there so if you do experience any delays on certain intersections uh definitely give us feedback let us know because we're happy to take a look at the detection um a lot of times it's just a detection casa verde uh, at one point on north fremont the wind completely blew it to a different area so it was just thinking there are no cars and people were piling up so it's always good to know these things thank you thank, thank you, you for your for your help mm -hmm. thank you i've got a follow-up question on traffic um so i'm sorry <laughs> to keep you there um i'm going to the um stevenson campus now on a regular basis and um on Highway 68 at the Morris Gate, um, there's that right-hand um, turn lane, and it's becoming almost a competitive activity for people to pass each other there. And it says no passing, but it's I've seen recently that it's getting worse. And what's happening is that you'll see somebody who's preparing to turn right you have two cars that are preparing to accelerate at the green light. And I've seen very close to a couple accidents that might happen there. And so I don't know if it's a state issue because it's a state highway or the city can have an impact on it, but it really would be great if we could just make that a right-hand turn only lane. So you can accelerate to get in traffic only in the exit from the Pebble Beach um, Morris Gate. Yeah, that's something that we definitely can pass on to Caltrans. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Caltrans. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. It's just a scary intersection now. It's just so competitive. People want to just get ahead, and it's not going to buy them any time. They're not going to be getting that much further. But there's a line of cars that are in that lane that are just expecting to pass 
the people that are next to them in the, the primary level. And they're definitely not paying attention to the sign that says do not pass. And it's <laughs> almost like a drag race. You see them competing to get ahead of each other. Thank you. Um, any other commissioner reports or comments? Excuse me. Anybody else over there? I got one. Okay, Mike. Um, listen to the lady talk about our trees today. I don't know if the commission realizes that we got the results back from the testing of trees in Monterey, which was an NCIP project, oh, by the way, that we've been trying to get accomplished for years. But it came back that it's, there was no special issue killing our trees. They're just dying. They're old. Well, okay, but we take medication for that. <laughs> <laughs> but there is a, they do recommend that there is a way that you can extend the life or when they're threatened. But the bottom line is we have lost thousands of trees in the city of Monterey. The city of Monterey used to be a city of trees and it's not anymore. One of the things I would like to see is that maybe a program to bring back trees into our neighborhoods as well as commercial areas. But it's the neighborhoods in my mind that are, uh, it seems to be a blight in the neighborhoods that's really affecting, if you walk down a street, you typically you would walk under trees. We don't do that anymore. And I've noticed that it's also affecting the fairgrounds, but specifically the city, I would encourage the city to see how we can come up with some way to get trees offered to the public. It may be a cost to put back in yards, to put back on, on the side. Sidewalks create, putting me in the next to sidewalk creates problems, but there are some trees that are less intrusive to damage to sidewalks and streets than others. But uh, I've had that conversation with Louie in the past, but we need to do something to help our neighborhoods. And I don't know, Kim, if that's something that Planning Commission can have discussions on or what, but it's something that we do need to, the city need to look at to bring back our vibrant neighborhoods with that pleasantry of the trees. Thank you. You know, um, I'm going to look up the city of Sacramento because they have a capital CIP uh, budget for just what you're talking about, where uh, residential owners can obtain uh, trees from the city of Sacramento to plant in their homes uh, without cost. So many per resident, so many per shopping center, because with a city that where the temperatures are burning up in the summer, uh, the trees make a big difference in in cooling it all down. And I don't know how much they pay for that or what the capital budget is for it, but they do have such a program. I'll, I'll take a, make a call or two, find out what that is. We have, through NCIP, actually had NCIP projects that bought trees for the city. But I'll be honest, I've not seen the results of those spending programs. So I, I can't report on that, but I, we do need something like Sandy just outlined. Thank you. Okay. Um, any other comments from commissioners? Informational reports and staff comments? I just have a, a couple updates of what's coming up on council agendas okay. and some things we saw last week as well. So on um, May 2nd, which is I believe next Tuesday, the city council will be considering the ADU ordinance that you passed and the airport land use commission and California division of aeronautics is still recommending a more restrictive ordinance than staff is recommending. So that overrule decision will be looked at by the council next Tuesday. On May 16th, um, the objective design standards under SB 35 for downtown and lighthouse will be on the agenda. Um, so those are two important planning projects. The other, I just wanted to update, um, doesn't really directly affect the planning commission, um, but does affect um, housing in our community. 
the city council um, directed staff to prepare a rental registry ordinance, which would require um, definitely all multifamily properties to register their properties in a city database, include their leases, include eviction notices, as well as rent increases. And the concept of a rental registry is to ultimately be able to understand the rental market with real data. And then the city council could decide whether or not to move towards rent stabilization or not. So that was a fairly, that was a four and a half hour public hearing. I believe it was last Tuesday. It went from seven to about 1130 at night. Um, so that was a big decision by our council. Good luck. Wow. Yeah. So your planning staff's going to be busy, just to say. Yeah. Just to say. Okay, item number five, planning office update. Is that pretty much it? Okay. Well, there's nothing else on our agenda, so we're adjourned.